There's a lot of controversy and a lot of confusion about the test for Lyme disease. And that's what this video is about. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Jason West and we're gonna talk about the Lyme disease tests that are available. This is part of our Lyme disease series and we wanna get you information so that you are aware of, and we wanna get you information so that you can know basically what testing is available. Now, Lyme disease is a complex multifactorial disease or condition and it affects everybody differently. And this is one of the difficulties with diagnosing Lyme disease because you can't diagnose based upon symptoms. For example, when someone comes in and they have a sore throat and you have them open their mouth and say, ah, and you see white pockets on their tonsils, it's pretty classic that it's a strep infection. Now, Lyme disease is not classic based upon symptoms. You can put 40 or 50 people into a room and you're gonna have 40 or 50 different clinical or patient presentations. You're gonna have some people that have joint problems. You're gonna have some people that have rash problems, some people that have sleeping problems, some people that have hormone imbalances or that mimic autoimmune conditions. And Lyme disease is the great imitator. It can imitate so many different conditions. It's really, really difficult to, to, to diagnose based upon conditions. So let's talk about some of the conditions or the treatments and the diagnoses that are available. So the first thing is the most logical place to start is have you been exposed to the vector that can cause Lyme disease? Now, in one of our current videos we talked about is it possible to transmit, you know, basically with sexual relations or in utero and medicine says no. My feeling is it may be possible because Lyme is a spirochete. Syphilis is a spirochete. Syphilis is transmitted sexually. Is it possible for Lyme to be transmitted sexually? I think it's possible. Does it always happen? I don't think it always happens. But going back to the testing for Lyme disease, have you been exposed to a tick? Now, it's estimated that about 60 to 70% of people don't remember a tick bite. Now, if you have been exposed to a tick, usually you get a classic bullseye rash, you can get a fever, you can feel flu-like, and then sometimes you'll start having some muscle and arthritic uh, involvement. Now, that's not always happens because Lyme is different for everybody, and the cause of Lyme disease is a sluggish or a compromised immune system because you're always coming into contact with bad guys, whether it's bacteria, virus, fungus, canker sores, parasites, amoebas, and if your immune system is healthy, you deal with that. I think it's more important for the treatment to make sure that people are healthy than it is to go after the bug, which is the antibiotic approach. Now, I recognize that people have outcomes that are favorable using the antibiotic approach, and my response to that is whatever gets people better, I think that you should do. Sometimes it's a combination, sometimes people, it's an antibiotic approach, Sometimes people, it's immune system response. I don't see a lot of people with good antibiotic or long-term antibiotic um, successes because they don't come to my office. I mean, it's not like they're saying, hey, I got treated with antibiotics, I'm doing really good. Help me to make sure that I continue that way. Usually what happens is people say, I tried a series of IV or oral antibiotics for six months, six weeks, six years. I mean, it's all over the place. It's not working, I need to do something different. So going back to the testing on Lyme disease, the timing is so important. There's a lot of false negatives, false positives, and basically there's a lot of confusion going on in the testing world. So if you get, take your Lyme test immediately after being exposed to a tick, sometimes there's false negatives. I just read in the scientific literature about someone that got bit by a tick, had a classic bullseye rash, they did some blood tests, it was negative, Four weeks later, it was a positive test. So let's start talking about some of your basic tests available for Lyme disease and then a research project that I think that you should be aware of. Now, a lot of Lyme literate doctors do what's called an ELISA test, which we look for the antibodies against Lyme disease. So if you have a bad guy that's in your body, the, your immune system will form antibodies to go after the bad guy. That's what the ELISA test is for. If that test is positive, usually they go to the next step, which is a Western blot test. The Western blot test is kind of the gold standard, or, or at least what a lot of Lyme people accept as 
the benchmark to see if you have Lyme disease. I'm not necessarily one of those. And we're going to talk, the reason why is because the CDC estimates that about, that you have to have five positive bands to be considered positive for Lyme disease. But there's a lot of factors in it play, and I know a lot of Lyme literate doctors across the U.S. that really think if you have one or two or three positive bands, at the very minimum, it means you've been exposed to Lyme. And for some doctors, that's enough to say that you have Lyme disease. There's also another test is the PCR testing. There's another lab that I like to use called Igenix that helps to identify if you've been exposed to Lyme. And then there are some clinics that are involved in a medical research projects using dark field microscopy, where you're, it's the same test that you're looking for syphilis, which is a spirochete. In the right setting, you can look for at the blood to see if there is spirochetes for Lyme. Now, I think a better criteria for looking at Lyme is, is there a history of exposure? Is there ticks in the area? Did you have a bullseye rash? It's really nice if you have a tick bite that you photograph where the tick was at different time periods, probably not after seven days, but you can see that an embedded tick, and then you'll take a picture at one, at two, at three, and four days. It helps give your medical provider some information. Now, when it comes to the testing, there's a lot of clinical judgment that comes into play. And I like this quote from the doctor in New York. I like this quote from the doctor in New York, Daniel Cameron, that says there's a lot of clinical judgment associated with the history, the exposure, and the presentation of someone that you suspect has Lyme disease. Not all doctors are comfortable diagnosing Lyme disease because the testing is notoriously inaccurate. Matter of fact, even the CDC says that some of the tests are only up to 60% effective. What's also interesting about that, in 2013, the state of Virginia, and then later on the state of Maryland, in 2013, Virginia, and later on, Maryland passed a law that says the Lyme Disease Testing Disclosure Act, which means that if you've been tested for Lyme disease and it comes up negative, it doesn't always mean that you doesn't, don't have the disease. It means that it could be a false negative. And I think that's really important to recognize that our best testing sometimes doesn't give you the information. Now, what's neat about the services that we offer, and I know other doctors across the U.S. offer it as well, is if we balance your body and make you healthy, get your immune system working, whether it's Lyme disease, whether it's a virus, whether it's Epstein-Barr, whether it's a chronic bacterial infection, taking the body health approach really does have a tendency to make everything better. Now, there's a whole bunch of different options when it comes to chronic infection. Some doctors use antibiotics. Some doctors use high-dose vitamin C therapy. Some doctors use LDA therapy or LDI therapy or NAET therapy. And what I tell patients is this. Patients know their bodies better than doctors. And if you're searching for a doctor, you're always going to be finding people that really like the doctor. You're going to find people that don't like the doctor. The proof's in the pudding. If the doctor's giving you good outcomes and improving your quality of life, I encourage you to follow that. If you're plateaued or you're not doing well, maybe you don't have the right doctor or maybe you're not getting the right clinical services, there's always hope. It's not just me saying that. I've got a lot of video testimonials up on our blog, dailydosevitaminh.com, and also on this channel where I want to share with you stories of hope, of people that are getting their life back. I have a new book call, coming out called I Am the Hero of my own story, and it's about patients that have beat the odds and have good health after Lyme disease, after multiple sclerosis, after autoimmune, after cancer. And so there is hope out there. I don't believe Lyme is a death sentence. You need to keep searching. There's always hope. This is Dr. West. We'll see you on the next video. And so there is hope out there. I don't believe Lyme is a death sentence. You need to keep searching. There's always hope. This is Dr. West. We'll see you on the next video.